that died for them and wants to cleanse them and forgive them. Holy Spirit, you're the greatest evangelist. You're the greatest preacher. We pray for these souls. Oh, Holy Spirit, have your way in this service. Have your way in this service. Touch our pastor. Anoint him as he delivers the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, now can we right now lift up our hands to heaven and just open up our mouths and glorify the Lord? Can we just create an atmosphere of worship? He inhabits the praises of His people. He inhabits the praises of His people. We love you, Lord. Oh, oh come on, let's make this an atmosphere of worship. Oh, we worship you, Lord. We are here for you, Lord. Oh, I know that that atmosphere is just where you are. That's where we want to be, is where you are, Lord. Oh, oh, ah. oh, 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 ah. oh, oh, ah. oh, oh, ah. oh, 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 oh,
was doing him as a sweet sound and a sweet savior. And then, oh, come on, let's sing again. Sing. Oh, there's Oh, 
Christ said to the church of Ephesus. We're going to Revelation chapter 2. And the letters that Jesus, the glorious Lord, listen, the first chapter of Revelation is the glory of Jesus. And his glory and about him. The second chapter begins with the letters that Jesus had told John to write to the churches, the seven churches of Asia Minor. Though there were more churches than seven, that's why we can look at that, consider there's something really we need to pay attention to. That is prophetic. Not only it can be considered dispensational of each dispensation of the church age from the beginning to the last day. Or look at it in essence of the fact that the material that's being sent out, the need and the problem and the sin of the church back then, it's just as real as it is today. And people, we as humans, we have a tendency, you know, the Bible says there's not a temptation such as not common unto man. So 2,000 years ago, the temptations back then are temptations today. And there are issues that the Lord wants to deal with us in our life and as the people of God. How many here want to be right and ready? I mean, you want to be right and ready. And that's why the letters were given to the churches. That's why Jesus was speaking to them, because he wanted them to get it right and be ready. I, I, I don't think you can... I don't think you can remove one of those from the two and have a complete understanding. You'll never be ready unless you're right. You'll never be right unless you're ready. So it's it's something that we all, how many of you are raising your hands, Pastor Ron, signifying to me that you know that these are the last days? I don't think I have to repeat. I mean, we've got enough going on in the news that, that reminds us of the crazy days we're living in right now. And that people need to call or call upon the name of the Lord. But I'd like to share this morning the first uh, of the message. The first message I shared was was a bold love, the letter to Ephesus. Then we looked into Smyrna. Smyrna Church was the bold endurance of a church that enduring and suffering the persecution, enduring in the Lord. Today I want to share a message found in Revelation, the same chapter. Verses 12 through 17, and I, I titled that Bold Confession. A bold confession. Something I've learned in the study, and I've been studying it for years. I used to just envision the letters of the churches that Jesus told John the right, those seven letters. I just, in my mind, I've always had it in my mind thinking of, you know, two of them got it right, two of them were good, Smyrna Church and Philadelphia Church, they didn't have anything that the Lord says there's something bad about you. That's in the modern terms. There's something about you that needs to be straightened out. And so I used to think about so much on the terms of the failures rather than what was in the letters themselves because every one of those churches were commended in some way by Jesus. They were doing something right they weren't completely wrong. And somehow in the configuration of all the churches of today, the churches around us, oh yeah, there's bad churches and there's good churches, just like there's good Christians and there's bad Christians. But I think among all the churches, I think about every one of them, they've got something right about them. And we can see a positive message for what's going on. We've got to understand the context where these people were living into. I, I, I think it's beyond our imagination to see and understand the environment they were living in. Uh, we don't have a right to be so critical of them because we ourselves, where we're at right now, we may not be facing what they were enduring and what they were going through. Christianity was not a social club. Christianity was not this fun group to join up with and sign up for and have meetings every once in a while, have a membership card and enjoy yourself, have some fun activities and stuff going on in events. Christianity then was actually what it really is meant to be today. It's a decision of a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a decision to live your life in Jesus Christ. 
Now you say, I can't do that because I don't think I can succeed. You're absolutely right. You can. But if you surrender to the one who paid the price and the one who is the Savior, you can do all things. And you can serve him. And you'll be right. And you'll be ready. Because of him. So we just got to look at this. And I want to share a little bit of the positive. I want to encourage you to come Wednesday night. Because Wednesday night I'm going to go into more detail of all this in here. Because I can't cover it today. Because I just feel like there's an exhortation God wants me to give today. And come Wednesday night we've been going through this. And I'll be going more into detail about their environment, where they were, what was going on, what certain things would mean. And they understood what Jesus was saying in that letter. We may see mysteries in the things that he said, but there were things that he said that were symbolic of what they understood where they were living right then and there. And we'll talk about that on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Come, we have a great time. I get kind of excited when I teach. I kind of, uh, I kind of screech, I guess. And kind of, you know, but it's but it's a great time of, of the Word of God. Wednesday evening, evening at 7 o'clock, we have kid men and we have teen men going on. Revelation chapter 2, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray, God, that I will effectively, and, and Lord, with, with your anointing, really, truly, God, say something that might, <clears throat> might, might impact our lives, Lord. I don't believe it when we meet, Lord, it's by chance that people are sitting in these chairs. I believe, Lord, that you're directing us and you're showing us your way, God, and you're wanting to reveal and give us a revelation of your word and understanding of you. These are the last days, but Lord, I know you said in your word that you would give the last day outpouring, and it's happened, and the power is here. And Lord, you're wanting to use us in a mighty way. Anoint me, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I ask it. Amen. 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 Go to Revelation chapter 2 in the New King James Version Bible, starting with verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has a sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Wow. I can just pause there for a moment. We can make that personal, couldn't we? Jesus knows. He says, I know what you're doing. I know where you hang out. And I know where the devil's throne is in your life. In other words, I know what you're doing. I know where you're hanging out. And I know the stronghold Satan has in your life. This is something personal. See, that though a letter written to church is written to people, the people make up the church, don't they? And so the Lord is speaking to individuals. So you just hang on to that for a moment. That The Lord knows your works. The Lord knows you. He knows exactly where you're at, what's going on. He's walking among the, golden, the seven golden lampstands in chapter 1. He's very much intimately involved in knowing what's going on with his church. And you hold fast my name, and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I'll come to you quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says in the churches. To him who overcomes, and I said this before, I'll say it again. In other words, for him to say that to him who overcomes, there's going to be overcomers. There's going to be overcomers. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. 
Verses 12 and 13 says, These things says he who has a sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell and where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name. Pergamos at one time was the capital city of the Roman providence there in Asia Minor. So they were very prestigious in the Roman Empire. And was known for its spectacular architecture and many beautiful temples dedicated to a variety of gods. If you've been following any bit of all in this series we've been going through, have you noticed that idolatry just keeps on being mentioned as the issue and the problem? I don't believe it's an age-old problem. I believe it's a problem still around today. Idolatry is anything you put before God, a person, a thing, activity, anything that interferes between you and your God and interferes and gets in the way of your testimony of knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If there's something in your life that keeps you at that moment being free, you're at some place or you're with someone and you're not free to say, I am a child of God to that person or in that place, then I'm telling you, you better get out of there or get away from there because you got an idol. Because something is standing between you and your God. Lord God, I didn't mean to get all serious here, but it just leaned that way, okay? This is serious here. We want to be right. We want to be ready. Okay. So here, the Apostle John wrote a letter to the Christians who lived in Pergamos. I thought of what was interesting about Pergamos is the word Pergamos, where, where you get the word. It means two words put together, marriage and elevation. And it was of that time in Aaron time Pergamos, if there's a marriage that took place between the church and the world, there was a, a mingling together, a coming together of the world that, that polluted God's people. And the Christians. And so there was a marriage and then an elevation in the ideas and in the image of the Roman Empire. Was this elevation. We might look good to the world, but how do we look in the eyes of, through the eyes of Jesus? We may impress the world and make other people think, hey, they're great. You know, I can go and do whatever I want to do. Let me tell you this. I want to tell you scripturally, you can go and do whatever you want to do. But make sure you know what you want to do is what God wants you to do and what is the heart of God. We have a freedom in Christ. And so therefore we have a freedom in here. You, you're not bound by the chains of the church to not do certain things. Don't you know how I know that's, that's not true? It's because there are people doing things and still going to church. So the church, you're not bound by the church, but you better make sure that you're bound in the love of Jesus. And that you love him so much that those things that are contradictory to holiness and the love of God and the word of God, you don't want to have anything to do with it. But that you want to have everything to do with Jesus. You want Jesus, all of Jesus, in your life. Now, it's important. It says here in verses 12 through 17 in this letter, it identified as being, it was identified as saying the words of him who has a, the sharp, double-edged sword in verse 12. This introduction was, was really it held in special significance to the people of Pergamos because the Provincial governor in that city, this is where they had the sole alignment with the Roman Empire, where other cities did not have this right. They they had that governor had what was known as the right of the of the sword. Rome's authority to decide which prisoners or accused prisoners or persons would live or die, including Christians who refused to honor. The divine Caesar. So here Pergamus, that governor had that sword of authority by the Roman government to do this. This wasn't this wasn't allowed in all cities. 
but it was allowed by Rome that gave them that authority of the sword. So John's letter is a clear statement saying that Jesus, not the governor, has the power over life and death. You got something pressing you? You think you're under persecution? You think your life is being threatened? You think everyone around you, and this is a pressing age. It's almost pressing to become depressing. The, the opposition around us and the pressure around us, there are a lot of talking heads around us, if you know what I mean. There are a lot of people who are talking as though they have authority and they're giving and dictating things that ought to be. And the Christian, as we live for Jesus Christ, may find it very difficult to live the life the Lord wants us to live unless we're willing to be persecuted for his name's sake. But here Jesus said, don't worry, Pergamos. All that governor thinks he's got authority, but I've got the state-of-the-art weapon of the time of a two-edged sharp sword, and then I will dictate, and I will decide, and I will rule, and I am in charge. Let me declare it to all nations and to all governments, governments on this planet right now, whether it be China or Russia or the United States or any other government, there are men and women, there are people who think that they're pulling the wool over our eyes. They think that they're in charge and they're going to control and they're going to tell us what to do. I'm telling you something that stands more sure than even democracy is the word of God and the kingdom of heaven and a Lord who has a two-edged sword. And he says, I will command, I will have the authority, I will decide what will happen to nations and to my yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The true authority of all is the authority over our life. Jesus. Oh, my goodness. I, hey, that's an encouraging word right there. Amen. Praise the Lord. I, I like being on the winning side. How about you? Yeah, I, I've been on a lot of losing sides. I've been on kickball teams and softball teams. I've been on uh, cornhole teams and I've been on throw hawk teams and I've been dagger throwing teams and I've still come up short and I don't even qualify for a white ribbon. I just don't even qualify. But I will tell you I'm so glad that the day that I cried out the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody, somebody here know what I'm talking about. I'm so glad uh, that when the enemy says you got to lose your life, you got to lose your life and you ain't going nowhere. There was one, uh, there was one who was waving a sword of authority saying, you're going to fail. You're not going to make it. But what he didn't see, there was one who was mightier, who lifted up his two-edged sword and said, I'm in charge of what's going to happen in this man's life. I don't know if you like to fly. I don't like to fly and I've flown before. And I had to get over a spiritual hurdle with it. You know, my emotions, you know. Anybody here nervous about flying? Oh, that's good. God bless you on this people. I know. I told myself, it's like riding a bus. But I've never rode a bus that goes 30,000 feet up in the air. You know? And going 750 miles an hour. It, you know, it's, it's just a little bit. You know? I never request a window aside. You know, I'm ready you know, to sit a little bit further away from it. You know, I just did I, I had trouble with it. And here I was, I was going to go to South America, and I was going to have to fly 10 hours to get to Chile. And so, so here was I got on that plane, I sat there, but, but the Lord reminded me something, and I got a hold of it and I realized it. It's this. I sat down on that plane before it took off, and it just dawned on me, whatever happens to me, my God is over it. it, it it's not the jet. And it's not the airline, and it's not anybody else. But my God dictates whether I live or I die. My God is guiding my brother. And that's a message for today, my friends. In a message in an hour where a lot of people are afraid, afraid to live, afraid to go and do, afraid to do this and that. And uh, let me tell you, fear is not an attitude, it's a spirit. 
The Bible says here it calls him the spirit of fear. God's not giving us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. And I want you to know that knowing that God is in charge and the Lord is leading me, that I know that no matter what, uh, hey, the world tries to vaccinate us and it doesn't completely take care of us. Uh, we try and do whatever they want us to do, wearing masks. Now, listen, I may get in trouble on Facebook, but I'm telling you, I'm not putting it down. I'm just saying it's never enough with the world. Uh, the world will always come up short uh, with the remedies and the solutions, but my God, your God is able to do a and a better what we never ask or think of. Hallelujah. He's the ultimate authority. Glory to God. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I don't want to die. I want to live. Thank God. Let's get my point to be honest. But let me tell you, child of God, if your appointment comes, and it will, it's going to come. I'm calling to all generations here. I'm, I'm buried every age group you can think of over the years. And it's sad. We're going to break your heart. But when it comes, and if it comes to me, and it were to be by that, you know, it used to be the C word was cancer. Now it's another word. I won't say it. I'm not it. But if I'm laying there, and I'm having a hard time, I'm going to tell that person, that's working on the machines next to me, I'm going to tell them, listen, Jesus loves you. He died on the cross for you. Yeah. Yeah. He cares for you. Yeah. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only answer, and he's with me right now. I may be laying in the bed, but under the bed is a big hand of God that will take care of me. And take Why? Because uh, he does not forget about me. He knows where I go. He knows where I hang out. He knows what I do because he loves me and he cares for me. Receive the confidence that you need this day. Confidence that only comes from my word and my promises. I hold eternity. No one else does. And in that time frame of eternity, there you are. And I know where you are and I know what you face. Be encouraged, my, my child, and know that I am the preserver. And I will keep you. And I will invite you to come into the secret places with me. And I will begin to minister to, to you and to lift you up. Believe in me and know that I am able. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. We just praise the Lord for a moment. Thank you, God, for a message in tongues, interpretation of tongues. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, John also gives the city of Pergamos a and an unusual designation. In the Message Bible, verse 13 reads this way. I see where you live, right under the shadow of Satan's throne. But you continue boldly in my name. You never once denied my name even when the pressure was worse. You never gave up my name. You never quit using my name. You never quit speaking my name. That's what the Church of Jesus Christ needs to do right now. We better speak Jesus. Amen. Better speak Jesus. Because he's the answer to the world. What the world needs right now is Jesus. And not to be afraid to say his name. Right now, on count of three, I want you to say Jesus out loud. Count to three. Do it. Everybody do this if you will. I tell you what, you can close your eyes when you say it. Let it come from the depths within you. One, two, three. Jesus. Jesus. One, two, three. Jesus. One, two, three. Jesus. There's no other name like the name of Jesus. No other name, no other name, no other title. 
no other person like our, our loved one, our Savior, our King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus. And Paul wrote about it, Philippians 2, 9 and 11. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Jesus said in Mark 16. Verse 15 through 18, and he said unto them, Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Let me tell you, don't you think today we need the name of Jesus? Don't you think today we need to implement and use and utilize the name of Jesus. Now, you can't use his name if you don't really know him, but if you know him, you can use his name, declare his name as a child of God, and all the demons of hell will have to yield to the name of Jesus. Every sickness has to yield to the name of Jesus. I'm telling you, the name of Jesus does not press you down. The name of Jesus lifts you what? For when you say his name, you're reminded of who he is and what he's doing and what he's going to do. And you know that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah, quit trying to face your demons with your own self. Start facing those demons of fear and depression and heartache and disappointment and say, in the name of Jesus, greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world. Everything in the natural life. 
Well, that's an emotional issue. Or that is a psychological issue. We have taken things that could be definitely, God says, I got the answer. It's a spiritual issue. And I can bring you out of what you're in. Right. In Jesus' name. Proverbs 18 and 10 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Yeah. And the righteous run to it and is safe and set on a high, far above evil. This stuff is going to go on in the world. Yeah? Whether you like it, I don't like it. I've had it. Listen, I'm right up to here with it. I don't know about you. You know what I'm talking about. This, I'm just sick and tired of it all, you know. What it's doing to people's morale, what it's doing to people's attitude, how it's molding and shaping people, even Christians, into their faith walk in the Lord. But I will tell you, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Yeah. You can run into it, guess where you'll be? Well, all that's still going to be going on, but you're going to be up above it. Yeah. And you're going to say, oh, yeah, 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 that's going on. And then maybe then you can pray about it. But you're up above it because the Lord, you have his name. And he's a strong tower. He's a strong tower. You ever been at one time I made a trip to Florida, one trip? I actually, it was the first time I went with my family. My mother-in-law, it's a long story, I won't go into the story about the timeshare and the place we went to. And I'll be careful, she may be watching this. I don't want her to lose her victory. But uh, the thing is, we went to a place, and we stayed at the resort, which was nice. But we went, the highlight of the place we went to was called Citrus Tower. And you could go up to the tower, and you could look, and the idea was you went up in the tower way high, and you look around, and there are acres upon acres of citrus trees. You see all the oranges on the tree. Well, when we, had, we got there, something happened. A frost, a killer frost that occurred uh, like weeks before we got there, and there was nothing. We went up to the tower, but nothing but dead, ugly trees. <laughs> Everywhere. That's all. There wasn't any citrus that could be found. I mean, you, you'd have to take a couple of orange trees to go up that tower to be in Citrus Tower, because there wasn't an orange to be found on any of those trees, and none of them were alive. They were dead. Maybe that's what God says. I want to I wanna lift you up to the tower. And you're going to see all the dead trees, but look where you're at. Because you're that important to him. Not, not much for sightseeing in a way of being, it being attractive, but you sure do appreciate the fact that you're alive. The Bible says there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus, his name, he told Pergamos, he says, you, you have been faithful. He said, you have not denied my name. You have not denied my name. We live in a time where our young people are growing up in a culture now that is, is so, is filled with pluralism, where there's, there's many ways to God. And they believe that, and they think in our Academia, the places of higher learning, which is foolish. The, the Bible says, a fool says in his, in his heart, there is no God. So anybody doing that, they don't impress me one bit. The greatest wisdom comes from the Lord. Again, your wisdom is the fear of the Lord, the Bible says. So... But our young people and many people today are growing up in a culture thinking that there are many ways to God besides Jesus Christ. That's why we need to say his name. There is no other way by which we can be saved but by the name of Jesus Christ. By the name of Jesus. There is no other way. There is no, I know, well, don't that just rub against our you know, open-mindedness culture we're in? Being power and understanding. You, you, you hate people. No, I hate sin. I hate what sin does to people. 
what it's doing to people, like Jesus said and told Tony, he said, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. He said, I didn't hate them, I just hate their deeds. There's no other way to get saved except by Christ. You can't save yourself and you can't go to another religion. There is no other faith outside of Christ. You want to be saved and you want to be right and ready. You've got to accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Now the thing at the point of decision of coming to Jesus and getting saved is this. The first thing I, a wall people run into is this. You can't live that life. There's no way you can be a Christian. You're already thinking about leaving church and going out and sinning. You're already, but that's the lie of the devil. But when you cry out to the name of Jesus, he'll forgive you of your sins and you'll be a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new and old things are passed away. And that the Lord will give you strength because within your own strength you can, but in his strength you can. You can. And that's very important today. Because people get so wrapped up, tied up, twisted in the, the ideas and the falsehood and the false doctrine of the world. The Lord will set them free. He has a two-edged sword that no matter what the devil has people wrapped up in, he can cut it loose by the power of his word. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Can make a difference. So I guess my big question to you is, where are you hanging out at? What are you doing? And does Satan have a throne in your life? Well, Jesus, his name will deliver you and set you free. He's the answer. He's the way, the truth, and the life. You know what? In these last days we live in, the entertaining preaching is going it's to end. God's going to raise up prophets who's going to make people mad. God's going to raise up pastors who's going to just talk about the judgment of God and hellfire and the judgment of God and salvation because people need to turn to a loving, turn to a God who will forgive them of their sins. People need to repent of their sins and turn to God. That's the only way there will be a turnaround. And I believe God's going to move in a mighty way. Hey, I, I don't think there's anything more positive. And positive attitude is to have your sins washed away. And being forgiven of your sins and being set free. There's no better positive place to be in than in that condition. Do you stand with me? I'd like for the worship team to come.